Okay, I'm going to introduce Clevis, uh, Clevis Headley. Uh, I don't know this person. I have no idea who he is, uh, <laughs> but he's going to be giving um, a presentation uh, by the title of Natural Kinds, Chemical Practice and Interpretive Communities. Uh, he's going to be speaking for approximately 20 minutes. Uh, if you have any questions um, that you want to raise as he is speaking or even after, please type the word Q, I mean, the, the letter Q on the chat, and I will keep a record of uh, all the people who want to ask questions, and then during the Q&A, I will call on you, okay? If you're having issues with your microphone, uh, then you can always type your question on the, on the chat, and then I can read it later uh, when, when the Q&A starts. So uh, take it away, Clevis. Okay. It's great to see so many uh, familiar faces. Uh, sorry for that little glitch. So my presentation today is um, a kind of a, a, a talk that is based upon a larger paper. But so I, I want to spare you the torture of not having to read the whole uh, the whole paper. And this talk is not technical; it's kind of like textual, and it's based on the uh, use of chemical examples and metaphors within philosophy. Okay, go on. Um, so I start off with, um, with an observation made by Ram Hore, and he made this observation, um, uh, uh, this, this statement, he gave this statement in a kind of an observational uh, capacity when he writes that the philosophical question of the viability of the concept of a natural kind is surely the most, excuse me, change it again, go back. He says, the philosophical question of the viability of the concept of a natural kind is surely the most important in the philosophy of chemistry. So a lot turns on this notion of, of, of natural crime, uh, 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 both in certain philosophical circles, as well as uh, in, in, the philosophy of chem, uh, in the philosophy of chemistry. Go on. This notion of natural kind is so, uh, some people consider it to be so important uh, that one um, uh, uh, philosopher, uh, Brian Ellis, approached the issue with a certain kind of fundamentalist favor. And he writes, the, says natural kinds must be categorically distinct from each other, for they must be categorically grounded as kinds and exist as kinds independently of our conventions. Hence, where we are dealing with natural kinds, there cannot be any gradual merging of one kind into another so that it becomes indeterminate to which kind a thing belongs. For if there were such merging, we should have to draw a line somewhere if we wish to make a distinction. But if we have to draw a line anywhere, then it becomes our distinction, not nature's. Natural kinds must be ontologically distinguishable from each other. That's a pretty strong statement. And clearly what Alice is, um, and what other things appropriating is the sharpness requirement, the notion that our concepts need to be sharp need to have sharp boundaries, but furthermore, that to the extent that our concepts refer to things, the things that they refer to, again, must be ontologically and determinate, distinct. Go on. Now, in supporting this notion of natural kinds, again, uh, Alice, it was sort of kind of fundamentalist favor. He talks about natural kinds as metaphysical necessities. Natural kinds then are contingent or anything like that. It talks about them in terms of their being metaphysical necessities. And he writes, he says, first, a metaphysical necessity is a genuine necessity. If something is metaphysically necessary, then it must be the case. And there is no possible state of affairs in which it will not be. Not even God, if there were such a being, could create a world in which anything that is metaphysically necessary is false. Secondly, Metaphysical necessities have to be discovered by scientific investigation. They are not discoverable as other necessities are just by considering meanings. Now, this is kind of an excellent um, capturing 
of, of um, a certain way of thinking within says analytical philosophy. And this, what Alice is capturing here forward is uh, the, um, the um, direct theory of reference championed by Kripke and Putnam, right? So very quickly, um, Putnam, Kripke and Putnam started essentially what we can call a research, not even paradigm or program, but an industry within analytical philosophy. And the direct theory of reference was proposed to discredit or uh, to replace, as it were, the descriptive theory of reference. So the descriptive theory of reference to notions that we refer to things in terms of cluster of properties. You know, Crickpree says, look, that's not the case. You can refer to the same person if you have the wrong set of, 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 of properties or some person may refer to a person and not even know any of the true properties of that person. So what Crickpree then um, uh, proposed was his direct uh, theory of reference or the causal theory of reference and says, well, you know, look, kind terms function like proper names, just as we saw sort of like paying proper names on things. Well, um, um, natural kind terms operate in a, in, in a certain way, but, but, but however, in the case of natural kinds, there's something else going on. That is to say, um, we, know, we don't identify things in terms of the external properties, rather we identify things in terms of their essences or their microstructures. Well, how do we know this? Chemistry supplies the best examples of natural kinds. That is to say, kinds that we identify in terms of micro essences or microstructures, whatever the case may be. So he says, in general, science attempts by investigating basic structural tricks to find the nature and thus the essence of the kind. So it's in terms of these essences that, again, that we are able, as it were, to, let's say, spin natural kind terms on certain kinds in the world. Well, there's a lot more I can say about the causal theory of reference or the direct theory of reference. As I said, it has been uh, it sort of uh, created a research industry within analytical philosophy, uh, you know, particularly Putnam's notion um, about the twin earth, where it is the substance, it has all the properties of water, but yet a different chemical structure, X, Y, Z, whatever the case may be. That's our Facts are facts only by virtue of the prior institution of some such dimension. This means not only that statements about an object would be assessed according to the conditions of the utterance, but that the object itself, and so far as it is available for reference and description, will be a product of those conditions. So again, we sort of bring this, a lot of this discussion uh, back to the question of how communities of inquirers uh, operate. Um, another uh, uh, quote here from, 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 from Fish, he says, interpretive communities are made up of those who share interpretive strategies, not for reading, but for writing text, for constituting their properties and inciting their intentions. In other words, these strategies exist prior to the act of reading and therefore determine the shape of what is read rather than, as is usually assumed, the other way around. What I want to do now is to sort of take this quote, this quotation, and sort of extract an interpretation of it and apply it to the context of chemistry. And here is a, a loose paraphrase of Fish's position that would be that would apply to a chemical context. No, I'm here. A loose a loose paraphrase of Fish's position that would apply to a chemical context would be as follows. Uh, a chemical interpretive community consists of networks or network or networks of various individuals who share a particular kind of training and expertise, a particular body of received knowledge, a body of experimental laboratory strategies for creating substances and for composing their properties and designating their disposition. Such chemical practices exist prior to the act of intervening in the world and they determine the form of what it is to be created or interpreted. And I think I could conclude this by saying that 
Um, all of this can be reinforced by turning to Alistair Crumbie and his notion of styles of thinking. And that's to say that when we talk about natural kinds, we could look at natural kinds in terms of the chemist style of thinking, which is a laboratory style of uh, a laboratory styles of thinking. So the notion of interpretive communities uh, nicely uh, commingles with the notion of styles of thinking, right? Uh, that is to say, philosophers are not to impose their style of thinking about natural kinds onto the chemist style of thinking about natural kinds. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Clevis. Um, so I'm going to um, start uh, the question and answer session. Uh, I believe the 12th, I'm scrolling down because I didn't see the screen. So um, Eric has a question. I'm sorry, Michelle has a question. Oh, okay, if, if mine is the first question. So um, there's an awful lot of effort spent in chemical laboratories on isolating and purifying chemical substances. And I, so, and, and this is part of the practice, not necessarily the text. So for me, the the relationship is much more dialectical. That there's that the the practice because sometimes even in the laboratory people are surprised by what happens. So and then they change their mind because of something that happened. And sometimes people even come up with new concepts or new new ideas or a new a new um, distinction that wasn't previously there in light of something that they notice or are able to notice. So I just want to know what your reaction to that is. So it has to do with um, the distinction between practice and text. The, that, that, that I think, you know, when, if, we, if we talk about natural kinds, mm -hmm. um, as I said, in the laboratory, there's, there's a lot of effort spent yeah. Uh, isolating those things. Right, right, right. So, so, but I think sometimes people thought that, at least in the rhetoric of philosophers, is as though those kinds are there, you know, at least we discovered them, right? This notion of metaphysical necessity. Whereas if you talk about the chemist work or the operations of chemists and laboratories, isolating them, I think then that there's a kind of a subtle distinction there, right? One that you can talk about that in the in in the in the laboratory you have to have certain methods, certain procedures, certain instruments that allow you, allow you to do that. So it's not as though you're just coming up on these natural kinds um, and, and discovering them. There's this kind of you you you're working with something, but the there's a contribution of a community that that, that broader context that 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 should be that should become the focus of attention also i i with i fully agree with you on that uh i i don't know how much you want to push the notion of natural kind and make it fuzzy uh and if the fuzziness belongs to the world or the fuzziness belongs to us so that, that's where i'm going i would say both <laughs> I would say both. Um, is uh, the fuzziness may be both in the world, uh, but I think that the fuzziness is also with us in terms of. I mean, for example, I have to confess this. I were, you know, we're going to a, a chemist, chemistry lab. I, I'm, I'm an idiot. I don't know what's going on. Right? Uh, I'm lost. It's an alien world. So, so is is this part of of being indoctrinated, being right, being able to be engaged in that kind of activities. And so there's a certain kind of interpretation that goes on there, right? We perform operations, and those operations or those experiments must be interpreted. And, okay. and that, uh, that, that, that opens up for the possibility of some kind of contestability, whatever the case may be. Or as you said, the surprises, when, we, when things develop that we didn't, we didn't expect. Okay, we have three more questions. So let's move on to the next, uh, Farjad. Yes, uh, that was a really a fun, exciting um, presentation. So I got this uh, quick question and we'll talk more later. Um, could there be an interpretation 
uh, an interpretive community made up of interpretive communities? Or does that kind of stop and some fade out something? Okay, like kind of like a matter, a matter interpretive community, right? In yeah. some sense, I guess you can say is that the International Union for Pure and Applied Chemistry operates that way, right? You know, is is you know what people do in their laboratories and university laboratories, whatever the case may be. But then there's that other body that every every once in a while they come together and agree on certain conventions. So I mean, uh, this the styles of thinking thing is so interesting. So I mean that connection, I, I totally go with that as well. And I'm just wondering whether does it kind of, is there basically discontinuities among these different styles, among these different interpretive communities, or, and this is my trick thing in here, I think the natural kinds thing that Michelle was talking about is kind of a, basically a series that <clears throat> think this is a transcendental object, a, tra a natural kind is transcendental object of Kant and so of course it's just keep going to keep going but it's not uh, it's not an ultimate category. well I, I, I I'm gonna I guess I'm gonna play chicken and take the personal way out and to say if there are natural kinds chemistry or science will discover what they are or tell us what they are but that would happen at the end point of inquiry right the final opinion so it's as though we have to allow inquiry to keep on going. And, you know, uh, is when we reach the end, point, the end point of inquiry that we can say, well, okay, now we know what, what natural kinds are. But of course, for Peirce, the notion of the end of inquiry is not a point or position in time. It is a regulative idea. It is without end. Okay, okay so, sorry for that. That's it. So maybe this con conversation can continue later. Um, we do have uh, Eric. I see that Jesus typed his question, but that may have already been addressed on the chat. So Eric? He's my, he's, he's mic. Your mic, he's, he's muted. I didn't mute him. No, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Clevis. Very interesting Thank topic, you. of course. Yes. Um, my question is this, you, you mentioned the Kripke-Putnam causal theory of reference. Yes. You then mentioned several objections to it that have been made by philosophers of chemistry. Yes. Starting with Julia Burston and yes. Van Brackel. Yes. All right. Um, aren't their objections based on chemical practice? And if so, what are you adding to the general discussion? It seems to me that when, you know, when somebody points out, for instance, that elements are problematical because there are different isotopes of an element. This already is a, it's coming from chemical practice. Right. Something right. that a philosopher might not know about. Mm -hmm. So, so your point is, what I want to say is in, in a part, among other things is the assumption sometimes is that the philosophers will supply the chemist with the philosophy, right? And I'm saying, well, it may be the other way around. Maybe if philosophers were to pay attention to chemical practice, they yeah. will get insights about how to do better philosophy. Well, isn't that what all these philosophers of chemistry are already saying? Yes, but I agree with them. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not arguing against them. Well, quite. So what are, what are you saying that's different from what these chemical philosophers have said? Well, what do you mean? What am I saying that's different? What I'm trying to do is to pull together this literature and ah. to say that that they, that there that there's some serious implications for certain programs in philosophy as a consequence of this literature. Because when Crick he came out with his, his theory, and when I was in graduate school, everybody took it for this is the gospel truth, right? right. So these philosophers in chemistry they are raising things that philosophers 20 years ago or 30 years ago, they know anything about. It was like Crick Keith said this and Putnam said this. And the, we, people thought that the Putnam winner, for example, was the most brilliant thing on the face of the earth. So I think that these, these, these philosophers are saying, you know, among other things, we need to pay attention to maybe how we do some training, right? How we, how, how, how we as philosophers, we talk about theories of meaning and reference 
and 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 sense of pay attention to how we do it and not as it were go over to chemistry steal these chemical examples and think that somehow the examples that that we're stealing are uncontroversial uncontested i don't know if that's helping yeah yeah we could continue some yes. yeah yeah i think maybe the one of the novel things that he's contributing uh, is this idea of looking at this from the perspective of interpreting community interpretive communities so maybe that this is his contribution to this whole critique of, of the traditional uh, theory of natural kinds mm -hmm. and also it's not perniciously relativistic because there is still a way of talking about natural kinds just not in the traditional way yeah right just objective yeah. okay um Thank you, Clevis.